Greetings and peace in the name of our Lord Jesus the Christ. Welcome to this Tuesday's Bible study. Um, we're going to begin, uh, I think we'll spend the week in Ezekiel chapter 34. I made reference to this on Sunday during the sermon. Um, how John chapter 10, which was the text that we uh, that I preached on, and I will preach again out of John chapter 10 this week, how um, Jesus' words uh, about being the shepherd really line up well with Ezekiel 34. And I think Jesus had Ezekiel 34 in mind when he made the statements, you know, I am the shepherd or I am the gate. Uh, and so at the end of the day, this is well worth our time, uh, well worth uh, exploration. And just a quick note too, um, as we discuss Ezekiel 34 uh, this week, we're going to also do it within uh, the context of sort of having a discussion um, about what it looks like for us as a church community to return. Um, we are going to be releasing the details of the church's return plan this week. And uh, we, the session and myself and, and staff members, we've really, really wrestled with how do we, how do we um, present a plan that's as responsible as it can be while also stepping out, realizing that, you know, we can't stay in our homes forever. Um, and, and we hope that you'll be happy uh, with the plan. And we just ask that you continue to pray for us, pray for the church, pray for the whole community, that as we go forward, again, God uh, would continue to sustain us. And Ezekiel 34 lines up into that, especially around this image of God's care for us as, as shepherds, um, as, as our shepherd. But that being said, we got to get through the really tough part of the first half of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 34, verses 1 through 10. There is a word of hope and good news at the end of it, so please um, make sure you get to the end of this video in verse 10 uh, to, to hear uh, that good news. So let us pray before we read. Lord God, we give you thanks for your word and just ask that you would continue to deliver us, continue to minister to our hearts, sustain us in hope. Lord, fill us with your love, give us your peace. And as we read scripture, Lord, conform us to the image of Christ so that we might glorify you in all that we say and do. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And again, just a quick note. Um, Ezekiel is written within the context of the Babylonian exile. Um, just a, a really quick note, if you go uh, to the beginning uh, of Ezekiel, uh, chapter 1, at the very beginning, he talks about in the 30th year, in the 4th month, in the 5th day of the month, I was among the exiles by the river Chabar, the heavens were open, and I saw visions of God. So Ezekiel's prophetic career begins in exile. He's literally by an irrigation ditch in Babylon amongst the people who had just been cast out um, you know, from Jerusalem, living under the oppressive thumb of the Babylonians in, in the middle of pretty desperate straits. And if you spend any time in Ezekiel whatsoever, you'll see that. I think Ezekiel's probably one of the darkest prophetic books uh, their Lamentations is, is really tough too. Ezekiel can get really dark. And so just a word of note, if you decide to take Ezekiel up, uh, realize it is uh, spoken by, written, acted out. Uh, the prophetic actions are acted out by a man, probably wrestling with what we would call in a modern context, depression. Uh, a severe depression, but this one is, you know, a depression that also is him wrestling with God through these visions and, and through God speaking directly to the prophet. And so this is the context in which we find uh, Ezekiel chapter 34. Uh, and in fact, if you go back to Ezekiel 33, and, and in verse 21, it's now 12 years later. In the twelfth year of our exile, in the tenth month, on the fifth day of the month, someone who had escaped from Jerusalem came to me and said, the city has fallen. Uh, and so basically, um, you know, they're in exile, and as if things were not bad enough, bad news returns with more bad news. And, um, you know, things have gotten even worse amongst, you know, kin or those who were left remaining in Jerusalem or in the surrounding area, you know. And so... It's the question that's, in, that's at the forefront of the prophet's mind is God has promised covenant loyalty and faithfulness, yet they're experiencing uh, unmitigated disaster as a nation and as a people. And the question that they're wrestling with is how could this happen? If we were really God's people, how could God allow this to happen? 
And so um, we start here in verse uh, in chapter 34 in verse 1, and this is a good way to get into the mindset of a prophet like Ezekiel trying to answer the question of why has God allowed something like this to happen? And so we begin, The word of the Lord came to me, Mortal, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, to the shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Ah, you shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with wool, you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the sheep. You have not strengthened the weak, you have not healed the sick, you have not bound the injured, you have not brought back the strayed, you have not sought the lost, but with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered, because there was no shepherd, and scattered they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep were scattered, they wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth, with no one to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord, as I live, says the Lord God, because my sheep have become a prey, and my sheep have become food for all the wild animals, since there was no shepherd, and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, I am against the shepherds, and I will demand my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall, I shepherd, uh, shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths so that they may not be food for them. And so, really tough, harsh words, no two ways about it. So basically what has happened here is that the exile has happened. There, You have a large contingent of people that were carried away into Babylon, Ezekiel amongst them, and they're just sitting there and they're wondering what comes next. But that doesn't mean that life has stopped uh, in Jerusalem or Judea. Now again, Jerusalem, the temple was raised and burned to the ground. Fields were sown with salt, a great deal of desolation and devastation. Uh, but that being said, it's not like, you know, there was no life that went on back in Jerusalem, back in Judah, back in the area. And so you had the exiles, many of which were princes, priests, things of this nature who were there, nobility, priestly families, what have you. But you had some that were there and had claims on that line. And so basically you had a form of government. You had puppet kings that were installed, you know, uh, that, that sort of thing. Maybe not kings, that wouldn't be the best word, but puppet governors. Uh, and, you know, in the midst of, you know, severe devastation, what happens to the people, and this is happening also in the exile community, you get desperate people make really bad decisions, and it becomes a sort of zero-sum game, uh, winner-take-all sort of mentality, and it's not a communal based approach to how to solve problems and so you have the very sins that the nation committed in the lead up to exile of you know looking out for themselves not caring for the poor the widow the weak the orphan it's now amplified in the midst of a pretty desperate dire situation and it's come to the point where even now, in the midst of their suffering, new stench is sort of rising to the nostrils uh, or, or before the face of God. You know, uh, Ezekiel himself is hearing reports, as we find back in chapter 33, of the things coming out of Jerusalem, coming out of Judea, uh, that uh, some of the practices that were going on there. And so in, in chapter 34, Ezekiel basically takes a direct line of attack against the shepherds of Israel. And by the shepherds, he means, you know, those in positions of authority, both priestly but also ruler, whether it's a puppet governor or what have you, where their policies and the things that they do are, are enacted and meant to look out for number one, to look out for themselves and not the good of the whole people under their control. The same thing again some of the same arguments and problems also happening within the exile community. 
uh, you know, vying for control, uh, you know, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, so to speak, and who's going to get first chair, you know, at water's edge. Um, and so Ezekiel calls them out and says, the word of the Lord came to me. So these are the, these are the words of God's judgment directly against the leaders of the people in the midst of this crisis. And the, the, the word is pretty clear. Starting in, in verse 2, there's a prophecy directly against them and just calls them out. You've been, fe you've been feeding yourselves. You've not been caring for my people. You've not been consoling them. You've not been comforting them. You've not been building them up. You've not been having them direct their vision towards me in the midst of this crisis. Maybe turning in repentance uh, and returning in hope back to the Lord so that they might be sustained in that. And so God's word comes directly against them. Uh, and again, I think there's also a very material element to this. Uh, it, we can't just spiritualize it and say, well, it, it, they weren't directing vision back to God in a spiritual sense. I think when you, we don't exercise justice and when we don't exercise care for neighbors and when we don't look out for others, that material reality just reflects what's going on within our own hearts spiritually. These words come against them both in practice and in spirit, their inability or their unwillingness to care for others around them and to use the emergency situation or to use the dire straits they find themselves in exile to look out for number one and secure for them a position of authority and power. God calls them to the mat. Ezekiel calls them out on it. And, and verse 3 makes this clear. You eat the fat. Now remember, in the sacrificial system, the fat was ultimately reserved for God, right? And so you, not to say that other pieces didn't have fat, but the fat was to be set aside and offered up as a, as a, as a burnt offering to the Lord, the sweet smell rising to his nostrils, so to speak. And here we have the shepherds, the kings, the priests, those in positions of authority, still acting out some sort of national, religious, political life, even though it's a puppet version of it, they're now even taking for themselves the best parts that are to be reserved for the Lord. Uh, and and there's also this double um, uh, entendre here where basically they are to be the shepherds of the sheep, but then they take the sheep, which are normally the burnt offerings before the Lord, the best parts to be reserved for the Lord, they take the sheep, a.k.a. the people, and offer them up for themselves, eating the fat and then also wearing the wool. It's a, it's a very complicated image at one level, talking about the national political life, then the, the spiritual life within the, the, the cultic um, acts of the of the people or what have you and at every level you have basically a group of people these leaders looking out for themselves and disregarding the things of god and disregarding the care that they owe their neighbor in that situation and so they're not feeding the sheep they're instead slaughtering them they're strengthening them they're not healing the sick uh not seeking the lost and and so here i think we could pause and take this as a good reminder um as I think as a church group ourselves, uh, and I wrestle with this often, you know, we're facing, you know, pretty dire straits both in, in our society and, and the larger world. There's the fear and anxiety around the disease. There are also the issues that we're facing, you know, just on a budgetary level. And I don't complain about it. I mean, there are a lot of people suffering out there. There are a lot of people that, you know, are jobless or have had their businesses suffer or, and all sorts of things. People, people are really suffering. And in that in that moment, it's so easy to allow our fear and anxiety to overcome us to where everything gets into a sort of lockdown siege mode. And, and my tendency at times is to do that and just cut everything out and just only, you know, care for the core of things. And, you know, it's a constant battle to remind myself and we as a staff try to remind ourselves our number one calling isn't to protect the institution of the church. Our calling is to minister to the people and minister to the needs that we see in the community, to not fall uh, under the words of judgment found here in these first four verses of Ezekiel chapter 34. That's what it means to be a shepherd, to be a leader, is that you're not looking out for yourself. You're ultimately looking out for the needs of the people. You're not looking out for the needs of the institution, for the people, caring for them. That's what's being called out here. And But when we've go the other direction and we're not responsive to God's will as we should be and and our worst tendencies come out what happens to the people this picks up in verse 5 and so they were scattered 
There was no shepherd. When leaders, when shepherds don't act like shepherds or leaders, when it's about them or it's about, again, protecting the institution or protecting the mortgage or any of those other things and not the people, the people then lack the leader that they need to have, the shepherd, the one that leads them, that you know even intercedes and prays for them and it tries to listen and be responsive to the will of God. That's not there and there's a vacuum. And that's what happens here. And in that vacuum, people succumb even more to the panic and the fear and the anxiety. It's so easy in a, in a situation like we find ourselves in to allow the panic and anxiety to come in. Leadership falters because it protects its institutional form or it protects its own position. And when that falls and the people aren't being cared for, then the people are left to sort of you know, fend for themselves, and at the end of the day, that's just a set of dominoes that leads to just sort of more fear and anxiety, not an organized approach to ministering to the needs of the community or, or the, the needs of the larger society. And so they become scattered, as we see here in verse 5, and that's why exactly what happened in Ezekiel's day amongst the puppet governors and the, the, the puppet religious leadership that was left uh, back in the, in the Holy Land. And so they were scattered. It goes on into verse 6. They were scattered. They wander all over the mountain and on every high hill. Well, what, what does that mean? We're not an agrarian society, so it's kind of hard to imagine. Uh, but if you look at a, a shepherd who leads a, a group of sheep, it's not that the sheep are just you know, all over the place. Um, you know, some of you may have more experience with cattle that graze land and there'll be like pockets of cattle here and some cows will go over there. They tend to disperse a little bit more, but not sheep. In order for them to be well protected and well cared for, they have to be taken to the place that they'll graze and they tend to s sort of congregate and be together. However, when they're scattered, when a predator comes in or the shepherd's not doing its job, they just, you know, basically scatter out uh, and they sort of get lost. And here you can pick up on all kinds of imagery like the, the parable of the 99 and the 1 uh, when Jesus talks about him being, uh, he himself being the shepherd. The image here is that the leaderless people are just, they're scattered. They're, there's no protection within the group. There's no one looking out for them. And thus they're easy targets for even further um, exploitation and that's what happens and so because of this failure of leadership amongst the puppet governors the rulers the elders the leaders uh, the leftover remnants of the religious authorities both in the groups in Jerusalem but also the problems that are happening in the exile group we pick up in verse 7 because they're they're responsible for this God speaks the word of judgment and it says as I live because the sheep have become a prey and there was no shepherd um, because they haven't sought out the people to console them, to comfort them, to bind up their wounds, to help them out. Uh, they ha because they haven't fed the sheep, uh, the word of the Lord comes against the shepherds. In verse 10, I am against the shepherds. You know, it's a devastating thing enough for leaders or leadership or even communities to come under the, the judgment of ultimately being left to their own devices uh, when under the influence of panic and fear and the disorganization that can happen uh, out of all of that. It's another thing for God to say, I'm against the shepherds. I'll be honest with you, this is the kind of thing that like kind of keeps me up at night as a pastor sometimes because I want to be responsive because as much as I want to care and be a good leader and I know other members of the staff want to be to care and, and be good leaders, in another sense, I, I don't want to be culpable to God. Uh, I, I don't want to be guilty and, and have these words spoken against me. Trust me, that's a whole other world of hurt for God to say, I am against the shepherds. Um, but that's that's what's said here against these leaders. And it's, it's a wholesale condemnation of when leadership fails and is faithless in the face of a crisis and, and doesn't rely on God. And again, keeps me up at night and I'm just asking myself, Lord, I may be stumbling and faltering, um, but just please keep me on the path I need to, to be on. And where I fall down, please pick me up because I do not want you against the shepherds. Please don't be against me. Um, again, this is something that kind of sits on my shoulders. And the, the Lord God goes on, I will demand my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the ship. God is going to intercede and God is going to care for his sheep and here's the word of consolation um, I 
They no longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths so that it may not be food for them. What you have here is actually a full circle. If you'll remember, and this goes back to the time of Samuel, um, the the before Samuel, before the before the first king Saul, the Israelites were governed by a loose association of tribes who had judges, and those judges were raised up at different times to provide a word of the Lord, lead the people through crisis or what have you. And judges, the constant refrain there is the people did what was good in their own eyes, which ultimately means that they did evil. They they wouldn't listen to God, but nonetheless, you know, it was God who would show up, lead them call them to repentance, to turn. It would work for a little while, then they'd fall back into it. But in the end, the clear message was God is in control, God is king, and God is the one who appoints the judges, who, who calls them. Uh, and in that way, Samuel himself was both a uh, priest under Eli working uh, and sort of an internship mentor, uh, uh, priest uh, situation, ministering to the Lord. And he was also, uh, he was also a judge. And so Samuel himself was raised up into this position to speak the word of the Lord and to lead the people. And we see Samuel do this often. And then, however, the people grow discontent with this and they demand the, a king like everybody else has. We, we want to have someone, a leader, to really lead us through, to consolidate this power. And they demand it. Samuel actually gets really upset with them and says, you know, you're going to reject the Lord God. Don't you realize that if you have a king... Um, you know, they're going to tax you and they're going to exploit you and they're going to do everything that Ezekiel's talking about here that the shepherds ultimately have done worked out for themselves uh, and not to the good of the people, not to the good of the shepherds. You know, Samuel's predictions all come true right here in Ezekiel chapter 34. And then finally God pulls Samuel aside and says, look, let them have a king, go appoint them. They have not rejected you. They have rejected me. All right. They've eject rejected the Lord God. So we've come full circle. Everything that Samuel ever predicted would happen have come true. The shepherds are not caring for the sheep. And now there's this moment of, yes, judgment against the shepherds. But the word of consolation here is that God has not forgotten his people. I will rescue my sheep. Where at one time, you know, we would look to a leader or a judge or somebody that God would raise up to shepherd and guide the people for a time. What's being pointed to here in Ezekiel 34, and again, this comes full circle back into Ezekiel chapter 1, and the one seated on the right hand, um, you know, the Son of Man seated in power there. Daniel 7 makes reference to it as well. There's this image of the provisional shepherds, the ones God raises up from time to time, and uh, that's coming to an end. There's a moment, there's a point coming when God, God's self, will be the shepherd, will be the one to guide in person. Um, I mean, this is Christological in nature. I think this ultimately points to Christ, and that's why Jesus himself picks up on Ezekiel chapter 34 in John chapter 10 when he calls himself the shepherd in the gate, the one that Ezekiel foresaw as being the embodiment of the shepherd of the sheep referred to here is none other than Jesus Christ, the leader of all leaders, the prophet of all prophets, the king of all kings, the priests of all priests. Jesus Christ is on his way. And of course, it's going to take hundreds of years for that to come. But that's the promise that's contained here. And there, and it's, and it's this just subtle, beautiful promise, I will rescue my sheep. Where we fail time and again to follow God's lead and to be responsible towards one another. Where we cannot seem to get it right um, when it comes to our care for others and love for God, Jesus does for us as the great shepherd what we could not do for ourselves. Verse 10 becomes a reality in him. Now I'm going to leave it there because it gets even more beautiful as you look down uh, further in Ezekiel chapter 34 and how Jesus plays with that in John chapter 10. But the, the word of consolation for me as a leader too is um, this. As much as I pray, Lord, keep me on the straight and narrow, help me be a responsible shepherd, uh, don't let me fall into these sorts of errors and, and keep my path straight, there's also this really great reminder that as much as sometimes I think I might be in charge, I'm not. At best, I'm a deputy shepherd. At best. 
the shepherd we follow is Jesus Christ. And that's why the church confesses and we say in our own confessions uh, of faith that Jesus Christ alone is the head of the church. Pastor Sam is not the head of the church. Dave is not the head of the church. No staff member is the head of the church. The session is not the head of the church. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He is the shepherd. We take our cues from him. And so the people of God, you know, are called to be discerning in their evaluation of their leaders, an evaluation of me, an evaluation of the session, an evaluation of anyone else that would lead the people of God. And that evaluation is, is to what degree have we cared for the people and, and ruled responsibly in accord with what we have seen in Jesus Christ, the great shepherd. Because that's the promise, I will rescue my sheep. Jesus Christ is the one who saves. I will never save a single person. Jesus Christ alone saves. I will rescue my sheep. And so that's a reminder as we get ready to think about our, our re-entry plans. I, I made reference to this uh, early on that we'll be releasing this week what our return plans will be. And, um, you know, I'll be honest with you, there there is worry, um, you know, um, the worry being that as we've try to be as com um, responsible as we can possibly be and um, careful as we can be. We don't know the future. We don't know what tomorrow brings. Things could change. We're not in control. So we have to balance between being responsible with, you know, all the unknowns. And the word of consolation here is that if we are responsive to caring for God's people as God has called us to be here and not receiving these words of judgment when God says, I am against the sheep. If we are responsive in that way, yes, we're doing our part as deputy shepherds the best that we can, and the other part of it, and that is the provision and the, uh, of daily bread, the provision of protection and shelter, the provision of things going well and it being well with us in the land, to borrow uh, words from Scripture, uh, as you'll find in Deuteronomy. That holy is the responsibility of God in and through Jesus Christ, who is our great shepherd. So we have to balance those two things. We have to balance being responsible, walking by faith, not by sight, but also using our eyes to the degree that we can to be as responsible as we can, and then, but also realizing that, you know, in the end, um, our ability to predict or control or measure or guide things is, is ultimately limited. And so we have to rely on, on that shepherd in the end. And so that brings me some consolation as well. And uh, we'll continue to be responsive and we just hope that you'll remain uh, healthy and, uh, and, and in good condition. And just ask that you continue to pray for our community, that we might be responsive to God's call on us to care uh, for one another, to care for our community, to model our shepherding on our great shepherd, Jesus Christ. And so uh, on Thursday, we're going to pick up with Ezekiel 34, starting in verse 11. We may get on to... Um, uh, I'm going to try my best to finish out the whole chapter because Ezekiel 34 is beautiful. Um, but we'll see uh, when we get there. But until then, uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Lord God, I want to give you thanks today for your many blessings. I want to give you thanks for the calling you have given all of us to uh, conform ourselves um, to Jesus Christ through the work and inspiration of your Holy Spirit. You've called us to walk faithfully and humbly and to love justice and mercy. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would empower us to do that. Help us be responsive, care for one another, love one another as Christ has loved us. Uh, help us, Lord, in whatever role we might have as shepherds, deputy shepherds, Lord, help us model that on the love Jesus has for us. Help us, Lord, just follow him in his footsteps. And Lord, so we ask that you would protect our community, that you would be with us, especially as we're thinking about plans for return. Bless those plans where we've fallen short. Lord, cover over with your grace. Um, build us up so that we might continue to be a blessing, uh, both with, within members of the community and, and within the larger Bristol community. We pray for our, all of our medical responders, Lord, um, and, and frontline responders. 
We just ask, Lord, that you would be with them, bless them, and protect them. We pray for all those who suffer uh, from this disease. We lift up Roxana Garcia and her family, Lord, that you would protect her and keep her healthy and, and heal uh, her son and her daughter-in-law and her granddaughter. We pray for uh, Dave and Dottie Whitesides, Lord, and the Bach family as they mourn the loss of Bill. Lord, just be with them and console them and give them your peace. Lord, we pray for Amy and her mom. Her mom's recovering from the virus. We just pray for full healing and restoration. We pray for Lennon and his family as she recovers, uh, as she recovers from the virus. We pray for Zach Botheroid, who has the virus. Lord, that you would heal him and make him whole. Um, Lord, there are just many suffering from this disease uh, in our nation and around the world. Just heal them and, and bring this to an end uh, quickly, Lord. Deliver your people. Protect us, guide us, keep us. And, Lord, we pray for our church and our session and our leaders and our staff, Lord, that you would just continue to give us wisdom. We pray for all those who join us uh, by video, Lord, that um, you would protect and keep them and their families. And they may have particular prayer requests on their hearts right now, Lord. Just hear the prayers of your people. And in all these things, Lord, help us look forward uh, to the day when we shall see one another again, when we shall glorify you corporately together, and uh, we look back at this and just realize that you were there every step of the way. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Until Thursday, take care, and remember, be a blessing. Bye.